Thanks again, Mashable. I'm really excited to uh, be here today. I'm excited to be in Florida because it's been cold and rainy in New York. And there's a ton of people here from New York. Um, so we're going to talk about a really interesting topic today. Um, you know, this affects all of us in this room. We're all focused on digital for the most part. And, um, you know, it's a scary title, right? Adapt or die. But what we're going to talk about is how social impacts shareholder value. Okay? So I don't need to brief everybody as far as what's happened in the last five years, but it's very prevalent. Okay? So back in 2007, when Facebook essentially opened up to the world to many of us, maybe some of you in the room who are still in college, um, it was crazy. People were testing things, people were doing apps, um, and they really couldn't measure anything. Right? We fast forward five years, okay, and social media is making massive waves. Okay? It is helping businesses, and in some cases, it's actually breaking business models. Okay? And I think we can all agree with this testament of what's happened in the last 12 months. Okay? So today, when we look at things, we really have to look at social as a very important and relevant part of the communications as us from a brand perspective and an agency perspective, or these brands might die. Okay? So, we're going to start with a quick story. We have three stories that we want to tell today. Right? And I hope everybody gets a lot out of this, because these are, these are really interesting data points. Okay? And I did actually take a picture of each one of those little Scrabble letters. It was fun. So you know, we started off with this program. Um, I don't know if anybody has saw this, but uh, on December 20th, there was actually a page that was developed um, called Beautiful and Bold Barbie. Okay? and beautiful and bald Barbie. And this actually wasn't developed by Mattel. Okay? The mission of this page was to create enough momentum to get Mattel to produce a bald Barbie for kids with cancer. Okay? Very simple. So when this, when this page actually launched, right, the start of it actually didn't happen from this, these, these two women. It actually started because their CEO had created a bald Barbie Okay, for a friend's daughter in Mineola, Long Island. Okay, the story spread really fast, and two women—one woman in New Jersey and another woman in California—they teamed up together to create this page. Okay, in just a few weeks, this page literally grew from zero to 3,000 fans. Now that might not seem a lot, but for a non-branded page to have that much momentum and that much engagement in such a short period of time is pretty incredible. A month later, this past January, it started receiving attention across all of the different media outlets. So the support skyrocketed even further. Okay? In March, they had over 150,000 fans. Thousands of photos were shared on this Facebook page. Kids with cancer, parents with cancer, their pictures, their stories. I mean, this just gives me the chills. The 150,000 people poured out in support to get this bald Barbie made. And there was lots of you know, petitioning to Mattel. There was a lot of stuff that was going on. And these pictures are from the fan page itself. And you guys can look it up online. And it's still going strong. Okay? March 27th, a little over a month ago, Mattel announced to the world that it would produce a doll that includes wigs, hats, and scarves. It was a bald Barbie. They put it on their corporate site. They put this message on their Facebook page. Play is vital to children, especially in difficult times. This could have been a big PR disaster, right? But instead, they actually listened to what customers were saying. So once they actually reported that, media went crazy, right? ABC, NBC, CBS, all these health sites. You know, Barbie goes bald thanks to the Facebook campaign. This actually created a lot of buzz, a lot of momentum for this, this actual cause. And one of the things that they did was they adapted to change by listening to their customers, and they made important business decisions that actually affected their company value. Should they have not created that doll, it could have been a lot worse. Okay? If we look at their shareholder price, okay, and this screenshot was taken last week, and it actually changed today. I think it went up uh, a couple of pennies, but almost 20% increase in a stock price from December 20th till today. You know, could it be behind this movement? Perhaps. 
Okay, but if we look at this chart, it's a pretty good indication of what happened. Okay, now let's take a look at another brand that tries to adapt but fails. So Eastman Kodak, 131 years of film pioneering, number one in everything, number one in digital cameras, number one in film, massive brand, right? But today, not so much, right? If we look at the, these charts that we have up here, you can actually see in the late 90s to early 2000s, the decline of film. And at the same time, we're gonna see the uptick in digital camera sales until the mid 2000s when we actually start seeing a trough. And I'm sure some of you can attribute that trough to something which we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, Kodak had a chance. So did anybody actually remember Ophoto in the late 90s? A couple people? So for those of you that, that don't know Ophoto, they were an incredible site, okay? This company created the foundation of digital sharing, digital photography and community. I actually have 30,000 pictures on Ophoto still to this day, okay? The great thing about Ophoto is that it was easy, it had a catchy name, it had a great business model, and it was simple. Upload your pictures and share with your friends. And if you wanted to print it, go ahead and print it, okay? Kodak purchased them in 2001, which was an incredible move for them, right? They saw this as a huge innovator, and they bought them, okay? One of the things that they did right away was nothing. They just integrated it into their site. But Kodak, being a physical company based on a chemical plant, started really producing and driving behavior from community back to fuel printing, okay? If you go to their site, you could print out gorgeous photo blankets. Really? Photo blankets? Trinkets, ornaments, stickers, puzzles, everything. Some of them were cool, okay, but the foundation of digital community went away and people stopped using it. In January, they went bankrupt, okay? They filed in Manhattan under US protection. In February, they stopped producing digital cameras altogether. They were the first ones to come out with a digital camera, and now they're stopped producing it, okay? So they adapted, but they fell back into their roots. As social became more pre prevalent, Kodak ignored the opportunity to turn Ophoto into one of the largest community websites in the world. This is pre-Facebook. On April 26th, this is recently, about a month ago, Shutterfly, which was the only buyer, put in a bid for 23.8 million to buy Kodak Gallery. And at the same time, right, big news, we're talking about this you know, today and tomorrow, Instagram was purchased by Facebook for a billion dollars with no business model whatsoever, okay? Out of curiosity, who would like a roll of 35 millimeter film here? Anybody? No? Okay. Who would like this iPod Touch camera, brand new? Becca, can you go give this to someone in, up back there? Anybody? Because I can't get off the stage. Right. So Becca's going to pick whoever she wants. So I, I, th <laughs> I think, all right. I think we see a pattern here, right? Digital is on the, on the incline, OK? Print, obviously, is on the decline. Not one person in here wanted a, a roll of 35 millimeter film. That could have been worth something one day, by the way. It is Kodak, OK? Tomorrow, Kodak Gallery will soon be Shutterfly for a mere $23.8 million. Drop in the bucket, OK? If we take a look at their stock over the last few years, one's trading at $50 a share, now at 27 cents. Again, can this be attributed to social? Perhaps, okay? This company, one of the most prolific and memorable brands in the world, in history, might actually die, might actually go away. The Kodak moment that we all know about might actually fade. Our last story, because I have very little time right up here, is about revival, okay? So this is a brand that could have died but actually adapted. So if we look back to 2008, many of us remember massive financial crisis, right? 
massive mortgage crisis, homes going under, car companies going under, car companies getting TARP, okay? But Ford didn't take any of that money. Ford reinvents itself in 2009. So in one quarter, okay, they spent a quarter of its marketing dollars on digital and social, which was double the amount of any of its competitors. Big step for an automobile company. The Ford Fiesta was one of their first big social launches. So this was a European car that they wanted to integrate into the US. And what they did was they actually gave this vehicle to about 100 digitally savvy bloggers. 100 people got a free car, OK? The catch was that they had to actually produce a video every single month, OK? So they actually wound up producing over 7 million views on YouTube. 132,000 people actually called a dealer that showed interest, and 83% of that audience had never even owned a Ford before. So this was a really interesting foray into digital. The next thing that they did was they introduced the Ford Explorer reveal. It was the 2011 reveal that they did in 2010, and they had more impact than if they had run a Super Bowl ad. So they actually drove 500,000 views to their website in this reveal, as opposed to the year before of just 7,000 during the Super Bowl, okay? They launched on Facebook with paid, owned, and earned, and they humanized this brand, okay? This is a direct quote from Scott Monty, and Scott was pretty much responsible for this movement on how Ford got to where they are today. Not only did we want to reinvent the vehicle, we wanted to reinvent the way we told the story, right? This man has done an amazing job. I'm sure many of you have seen him in the press, and uh, I've got to give kudos to him. In 2011, they reported the biggest annual profit since 1999. That's a massive accomplishment for a company that was going to go bankrupt. In 2012, they launched Ford Social. So this was all about bringing people who love Ford, bringing people who wanted to improve the cars, bringing owners together, and putting social at the core. And if you check it out, you can go to ford.social.com. Okay? In January 2012, this was a great article in Ad Age. Matt Van Dyke, director of US Marketing Communications. Ford, at Ford, social media is bigger than advertising. That's a really bold statement. Social media is bigger than advertising. That tells us something. Okay? And then again, let's take a look at their stock price, up 600 hundred percent since they started investing in social. Six hundred percent. Silence, right? So, you know, if we look at the, you know, these three big stories, you know, is social, you know, to take all the credit for Mattel and Ford's success? Again, perhaps. But I think if we call up their CEOs today, and we asked them if they made good business decisions based on what they did by listening to people and spending money in digital and social, I guarantee you they'd say yes. So thank you guys very much. We're going to have this um, presentation, I believe, on the Buddy Media site on Sunday. Um, you guys could always tweet to me, and I, I could email you guys the presentation as well. And um, thank you guys so much. It's great to meet so many of you today, and uh, looking forward to meeting more of you later on. So thank you so much.